ourselves briefly. I'm Michelle Ferguson. I'm a professor of political science at CU Boulder. And I went to Knutpunkt and lived to tell the tale. <laughs> um, and I'm here with Nick. Hi, uh, so I'm Nick Proctor. I'm at, in the history department at Simpson College, which is in central Iowa. I'm also currently the executive director of the Reacting Consortium, and I went to Knutpunkt with Michelle. All right, so uh, let me just call on you, and then that way we'll make sure we get to everybody. John? Hi, uh, I'm John O'Keefe, uh, Associate Professor of History at Ohio University of Chillicothe. Uh, and yeah, I kind of read an article about some Nordic LARP and was really interested. And then it just so happened that this conference is happening. So I'm here to learn more. Hey, right. Gus? Hi, I'm Gus Bono. I'm an academic advisor slash first year experience teacher over at UW Platteville in Wisconsin. Okay. All right, and Anne. Hi, Anne Sigley Draghi, and I'm uh, an associate professor of English at SUNY Fredonia in New York. Um, and I uh, haven't done the happy hours before, so thought I would um, try to jump into some now this fall. And um, I'd love to hear more about the LARP experience. <laughs> Okay, and Harry, we were just going around and introducing ourselves, so you came just in time. Uh, if you're willing to just briefly say who you are. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Harry Schantz. I teach actually high school uh, at a private school in uh, suburban New York, the LaFell School. I've been using Reacting in the history department here for, this is my third year using the program, um, and it has completely transformed the way that I teach in the classroom, whether or not I'm actually using reacting at that time. Uh, and I'd say that I, are my current juniors who were the guinea pigs that played Confucianism their freshman year, they were the guinea pigs for uh, Nick Proctor's re reconstruction game last year. When I told them that we were playing Yalta this year in the honors class, uh, there were cheers throughout the classroom. So they were very <laughs> excited for that. And that's not until January. So it's definitely something that I have a lock on them for until then. All right. Um, so may maybe we should just start just so we know that everyone is kind of on the same page by explaining what Knutpunkt and Nordic LARP are. Nick, do you want to give a stab at that? Sure. So, uh, I'll, so I'll try Nordic LARP first. So Nordic LARP or live action role playing uh, is a, a emerged as sort of a particular form in the Scandinavian countries. Um, and it's, it's really that they, they, they try for deep immersion into the game um, and and it's often to achieve some kind of a profound emotional or transformational experience from the game, uh, an, an ability to really explore a different way of looking at things. Um, they uh, and th they often take place over the course of a few different days, uh, a few days, like two or three days. Um, so. One of the things that's attracted me to Nordic LARP and wanting to learn more about it is because they often deal with heavy themes, sometimes heavier themes than reacting games, um, is they have really done a lot to develop safety mechanisms uh, so that their players can engage in really difficult issues, but do so in a way that is safe for them that allow them to back out of and come back into conversations and experiences um, on their own terms, um, but while still honoring the structure of the game. So this to me seems like a thing that reacting needs and, and can benefit from knowing a lot more about. So, uh, so that was really several years ago, probably six years ago or so, is the thing that got me reading a lot more about Nordic LARP. So Knutpunkt is, that's Swedish for meeting point. Um, sometimes it's in another country and it's called Knutepunkt. <laughs> um, so different Scandinavian countries, different languages, they pronounce it differently, even spell it differently. But it's a conference that typically happens in the spring and rotates around between 
Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Norway in some combination, some order. Uh, so uh, it happened this fall, we believe, because of COVID-related delays, um, but it wasn't entirely clear. But the next conference is in April in uh, Denmark. Um, yeah. So that And that's their normal time of year that they would be having uh, the conference. So Knutpunkt is, um, it's a massive four day party slash LARP slash festival slash conference. Um, I don't know quite how to describe it, um, but there are breakout sessions where uh, LARPers could be talking about LARP and they seem to think that this was a really unusual thing Oh yes, okay, so the Finns call it something completely different as Nick has put something I cannot pronounce into the chat. And nobody other than, uh, than the Finns at the conference were capable <laughs> of pronouncing it the same. Everybody tried, you know, but uh, but it sounded a little different to me anytime I heard a non-Finn say it. Yeah, all right. Um, but the, well, well, I, I put it up there just to, just to put in, one of the things that's great about, about the conference is it's all in English. And part right. of the reason is because the other Scandinavian languages have a hard time translating uh, Finnish. Right. Um, John, you should feel free to use chat as much as you want. I believe that the chat gets recorded, but I will also keep an eye on chat and try to bring things into the conversation, um, unless you really don't want me to, in which case send it as a private chat. Um, anyhow, uh, so uh, um, you know, when, when the Nordic LARPers and other folks who LARP um, do their LARPs, they generally show up for an event. Um, they do some prep work, just like we do prep work for reacting games. They play the scenario, they do a debrief, and then they go home. And so they don't generally at those events have the time or opportunity to talk about what the heck is it that we're doing when we're LARPing. And so Knutpunkt seems to be really attractive to a lot of recreational LARPers and LARPing designers in part because it is a chance to get together with a whole bunch of people and have those sorts of meta discussions and reflections. Um, I think we actually do a lot more of that in reacting in part like on the, at these Friday happy hours. Um, and, and so it was really interesting to see how much they were starving for it, uh, where it didn't feel like something I was particularly starving for. Like I wanted to find out what they were talking about, but they just wanted to be able to talk. Um, so a lot of people actually go to the conference just to go to those breakout sessions and talk about LARPing. There are some short LARPs that happen at the conference and Nick and I each played a different set of those. Um, so we had different experiences because we were not playing the same games, except for one game we both played. Um, there are also parties. Um, there are events where people are showing up in costume because they want to be in costume, but nobody's required to be in costume. So if you're just there in a t-shirt and jeans, it's totally cool. Um, uh, but if you want to show up in your Versailles friendly Louis XIV outfit, that's cool too. And, it, and everybody takes both of them in stride. Exactly. Um, so it's a very, I think, very inclusive and welcoming environment in a lot of ways. Uh, again, in part because of the safety mechanisms uh, that, that they're used to using, and in part because it just is the kind of conference that aspires to be inclusive. Um, yeah, and, so, and uh, well, just visibly, they've succeeded extremely well in terms of being welcoming to queer participants. Uh, toward for sort of visibly there uh, and 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 happy and and, and out in large numbers. Uh, the place where clearly they're having some struggle is in terms of of ethnic diversity, um, which was a thing that you know it was marked um, in in terms of the composition of who the attendees were. Because it's, it, it's it. Oh, good. We both had the experience that it was like the whitest conference we'd ever been to, which to some extent is Scandinavia, but to some extent isn't. Right? Scandinavia has twenty, or sorry, Sweden had has twenty percent uh, immigrants in its population, um, at least ten percent of which are from the Middle East, North Africa. That is, would not be white presenting. Um, 
And yet I maybe saw a handful of people of color at the entire conference. Mm -hmm. uh, they were also attracting participants from 19 different countries, um, including the United States. Uh, so there were a lot more than just me and Nick from the United States. Um, and so they could have been drawing in a more diverse group of people uh, also from other countries, not just from the Scandinavian countries. And so that that was a topic in the book. So let me get the book, um, another piece of show and tell. There's a whole magazine that they produce for Knutpunkt. Um, and one of the, the articles that the, the uh, main editor for the issue uh, pointed out when he was advertising this is this one where they're interviewing LARPers of color about their experiences um, with LARPing, um, including, uh, again, some uh, American LARPers in here. Uh, and uh, definitely, like, some people in the community are thinking about this issue, but maybe not enough. Um, also, the day before Knutpunkt, there was an all-day conference specifically on edu-LARPing. So that's using live-action role-playing in education, whatever that means, right? There were people who were talking about using LARPing for more like elementary school populations or more high school. Um, there were some people who were uh, developing LARPing simulations for museums or for other sorts of educational purposes that weren't about degree seekers or um, required schooling. Um, and Nick and I gave a presentation uh, at that, that pre-conference about reacting uh, to them. And oh, and Nick one, the chat for the magazine, which is awesome. Yeah, I, I, I stuck a, a URL if you wanna look at the at a PDF of the magazine. And, um, when, when we were presenting, I think that, that Two things, two things about what we were talking about, well, at least two, really impressed the audience. One was that we had so many published titles. And, and, and that sort of goes to the practice of, of writing the LARP script, which includes roll sheets, background, production notes, notes for game masters and that notes. sort of thing. Notes for game masters and that sort of thing. Was, was, was impressive to them. Uh, and the, the other thing that really amazed them was just how many schools use reacting. Because um, Nordic LARP is a really intense community, but it's not that big a community. And there are educational LARP who are scattered around Europe, but they're not really coordinated. They're, they're, they're kind of, you know, doing their own thing. I think the other thing, I, well, I already have to add a third thing that baffled a lot of them was that reacting games are designed to be run by one person. Um, because in a lot of recreational LARPs, it's, it's like a, a one to 10, one to eight facilitator to player ratio. So um, it's it, so it's it's very. This is one of the reasons why it's it's hard to to repeat them. Is you sort of need a crew that's working really well together with a shared vision in order to pull it off. So when we were like, well, yeah, you could you could do this with fifty people, um, they, they were just like the what. Um, and uh, yeah, and we talked about that and sort of figured out why we think that is. Um, so one of the things is that, that reacting games, while they can be emotionally engaging, are not often intensely emotionally engaging in the way that a lot of LARP, of recreational LARPs is. And the other one is that you have you usually you're playing no more than an hour and a half at a time, and then you have a break for a couple days. So, um, so the fact that you have this opportunity as the game master to do what recreational LARPers would call calibration between sessions, where you can think about, okay, well, this happened, and what needs to happen now, and is everybody okay, and how are we feeling, and let's take the game in this direction. You've got plenty of time to do that. Whereas if you're running a 48 hour LARP, you're, you're basically trying to do all that stuff on the fly. 
And because it's so immersive and intense for a very brief period of time, they need to have staff who can be like safety officers where you can just get out of character and go and talk to them separately if you're really having a hard time um, in a way that uh, for a reacting game, you have the natural break of the class ending for that day. Sorry for the cat. Um, uh, and, you know, and so you as the instructor can check in with students and you've got plenty of time to check in with them before they're supposed to get back into character. Um, so there's just like a, a safety valve built into reacting that they don't have, but the trade-off then is that our games are a lot less immersive. But it is a thing that we've talked about um, that Jan and Maddie and I have talked about. Well, and other people have been part of the conversation too, because reacting conferences uh, can come as close as a reacting game can come to that kind of intensity. I think because you're you're playing the whole game in a day and a half, uh, and you're often stacking things up. Two of the things that they did at Knutpunkt, um one of which I think we might do is they had some people who were identified as safety officers and they had like a little sash so you could see them across the room. So if something was happening or you were starting to freak out or just feel discomfort, you had these people other than game masters that you could go talk to. Um, the other thing, which was fascinating, I don't know if we'd actually want to try it at a face to face reacting conference is they also had like, a chill out room um what which is where you could just kind of like go and it had low lighting a little cot with some pillows on it you could just kind of like go there when it just all became a little too much for you um and people were using it you know i i, I saw people going in and out of that room so um usually because when we run a reacting conference there's like coffee shops and stuff like that around i i don't know if we need a space but having staff where their main purpose is to talk to people who are having troubles uh, or who are just just uncomfortable. Uh, I think that that could be a real good practice that that we could lift from from KP. So I want to add one other thing that's different that we're doing in reacting that that Nordic LARP doesn't do that I think people were also really shocked by at that edgy LARP conference. Um, which is that we're not just looking to have games run by a single GM. We're also looking to have games that can be run by a single GM who has never played a game before in their lives, right? And that is totally different from what they're expecting. And they were often like just shocked, horrified. I felt like I was getting a lot of judgment from people who seemed to think that like it, like you need to have the right skills to be able to run a game. Um, or I talked to people who were game designers who thought that there's no way anybody else could possibly run my game. Like that is my game. No one else understands my vision. Um, and let alone someone who's never LARPed before, right? Like that, like for some people, they were just horrified by it. For a lot of the people in the Edgy LARP conference, they were actually really intrigued because. Um, I think somebody said to Nick at one point, like for our conferences, we're literally training hundreds of people to GM all at the same time, right? Like the scale of what we are doing is just so far beyond what they have imagined that they could do in their own development of edu LARPs um, that it was, you know, it was kind of reassuring. Like, I don't know, I kind of felt like we were the country bumpkins showing up at this conference. <laughs> And all of a sudden on day one, there were these people who were like, oh my God, what you're doing is amazing. And it was really reassuring in a lot of ways. It it was also one of those things that usually happens when you travel abroad where you really start to feel your Americanness, you know, where Michelle and I were like, okay, we really like your little cool apprenticeship system and everything, but how do we make this into a mass? a mass movement and how do we monetize it? How do we standardize it? Um, and quite rightly, some of them were like, no, this is like a boutique art form. You know, that that that's why we do it. And that's part of the appeal. Um, but I think that that sort of our ambition as reactors was, well, a game is a good game if 
you have thousands of people using it every year. Uh, you know, and they would be like, no, a game is a good game if I run it with eight people and we all have an awesome experience. So we could, I mean, Michelle and I can talk for the next two hours about our experiences at KP. Um, but do you all have any questions for us just about Nordic LARP or what we are thinking we might learn from Nordic LARP uh, in Apply to Reacting? Yeah, Ann. Or what you were thinking you might learn from Nordic LARP. Right. Well, I, this, this was just back on what you were just saying. And if there were people from 19 countries there, you said, mm -hmm. so, how about other places besides Scandinavian countries? Like what were their reactions to hearing about reacting? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the countries outside Scandinavia that were uh, outside Europe that were there were US, Canada and Japan. Um, and otherwise everybody else was, was from a European country, um, mainly Scandinavia, but there were, I met people from France, Italy, Spain, Holland, UK, um, Germany, Poland, Slovenia, uh, Croatia, I think that's it, Hungary, um, so you know, a real kind of EU plus uh, arrangement of people. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk to the folks in Japan, but um, I do know that probably now the biggest recreational LARP scene in the world is in China, uh, where costume quasi-historical LARPs are, are huge, like that have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are LARPing in China, but for all kinds of reasons, it's really siloed off from, from other experiences. The, um, the other people from the US and Canada got reacting pretty easily because their, their higher education system, they're familiar with higher education in the US and Canada is like, oh, I see, I see why you do it that way and I see how that could fit. Um, so, uh, so that, so that was, they, they were not puzzled at all, uh, in terms of how it works. Mm -hmm. The, the puzzlement of the Europeans often, I think that one of the best pieces that we went to was at the EduLARP conference and was by, hold on, I got it on my back. <clears throat> it was from some people at the University of Munich. Uh, Dr. Katrin Ganus. Um, and she and the people that she worked with have sort of like developed this list of principles for role playing games um, that are really German. There, there's like this German ethos to them where it's like all of the players need to have exactly the same amount of power. And that there's this kind of radical egalitarianness that's a part of the structure of the game that's important to them. She teaches like the, at the equivalent of sort of like 10th, 11th grade. Um, and uh, so, we, and, and we had like a, a really good breakfast conversation one day. She had two of her graduate students with her, but I think that it was, it was interesting in talking to people when you would have a conversation where there were people from just one country, it was clear that they had a few national LARP conventions, like, like not convention meeting place, but sort of ways of doing things in their LARP culture. Um, and I think that we really only started to scratch the surface in terms of understanding what the different national characters are. Yeah, and a lot of people were explaining to us that the LARPing community in, in their countries was really quite small. The Norwegians were very insistent on that. Yeah. They seemed to be really frustrated by their fellow Norwegians that more of them were not LARPing. Um, but I also heard that from, uh, from Polish people, from the Ukrainian people I spoke with, who obviously, you know, I mean, with the war, are not LARPing in Ukraine, um, but we're talking about what things were like before the war. Um, 
uh, and, you know, and so it just varied. But then like we went to a presentation where there was this Italian game designer who talked about a LARP that he had pulled off that involved hundreds of people and from different nationalities. So sometimes like these small communities, people are traveling across borders in order to play. And again, it's, it's quite common that the games are done in English in order to accommodate people coming from different linguistic backgrounds. Um, so really beneficial to us if we want to go to Europe and play some games. Yeah. Um, but then, then there are also other communities like in Denmark, it's really quite huge and it's very common, very mainstream, you know, they were describing it as mainstream. It's not a sort of fringe community of people that are doing this. Um, and so they will have a lot of LARPs that are in Danish because they, they can count on being able to even have a very large LARP with hundreds of people and they would have enough people to draw on who would be able to afford to come and take the time off to be there. Yeah, it's it seemed to me that that Denmark and Sweden had the biggest communities um, and that Britain was maybe where there was the biggest commercial LARP community where sort of they, they would repeat the same LARP sometimes right. at the same venue and they would have multiple iterations of it and the people coming were partly LARPers, but they were also just people who were like, this sounds fun um, because it's about vampires. And I think vampires are cool. Uh, so so the British model seemed a little less a little less insular uh, than, than the other ones. And the Americans seemed the same way, but they seemed much more frustrated than the British people about getting to actually play their LARP. I think that a lot of the Americans were like, dang it, this is super cool. Why can't we get our games to fill? Yeah, and some of the American game designers would talk about things like when they advertised their games, they would get a lot of people who were just into cosplay showing up who weren't really interested in the immersive role-playing aspect, but were after something else. Um, and that they were having a hard time figuring out how to explain to people who were signing up for their events what exactly it would be entailed. Yeah. Um, but again, there also were micro communities in the United States. Like we we met a woman from Houston or Austin, I don't remember which, who, uh, you know, she works for a university but wasn't there as an academic. She was there as a recreational LARPer who's been involved in a vampire LARPing community in Texas for a long time. And so you've got, you know, again, if you've got your eight friends who are totally into this and you've got somebody else who's willing to design and come up with the sets and the scenarios, then you can actually have a very intense ongoing uh, community that's really quite small. And, and because of COVID, there were all of these LARP productions that were stacked up in on hold. So apparently for like the past nine months or so, it's just been sort of like LARP, 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 because there have been all of these things that they're finally able to run. But because there were all these projects on hold, very few people were working on their next project. So the, so the LARP community like that it seemed like the general agreement was there's going to be a new trend in LARP but we don't know what it is yet um because there because we're we're different and the culture is different um and we sort of have a clean deck but we're not really sure what the change might be because the the other big change seems like it happened in the early 21st century where most of the LARPs were these high costume um, boffer LARPs where people would poke each other with, with plastic swords and people got bored of that. And then these really immersive LARPs kind of took over um, and people are sort of thinking there's gonna be another revolution like that. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, thank you, John, uh, for that extensive applause. Your question, please. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Uh, so yeah, I was I was also kind of curious. This is sort of a bit of a change of direction, but um, since there was this large edu LARP um, uh, aspect of things, I'm kind of interested in, in what you all saw as some uh, other sort of educational LARPs and maybe some 
uh, important or interesting or striking differences between reacting and those. Uh, and then actually, I have a second question that is maybe maybe the second question might go a little bit first. But I was sort of curious, you know, like it sounded like th there were a lot of people who were really kind of interested and fascinated with our, our React in the past. Um, and I was kind of wondering if there were particular games that they were particularly excited about. But that's sort of you know my general curiosity. Okay, so so I'll say that Nick and I played two um, shorter educational LARPs, one of which was much shorter than the other. So at the Edu LARP. Uh, conference, we played a very short one that was called something like Europe the Band. Um, and so we all thought it was going to be about the final countdown, but it wasn't. It was actually a very silly way of simulating some of the internal conflicts in the EU. So I, as a political scientist, could imagine a comparativist using this as a fun exercise um, in a class about the EU or international institutions, um, because the, like we were all playing members of a band whose names were plays off of uh, different European Union countries, and and it was basically like the original band members uh, and Brit um, had decided not to go on tour with us anymore that Brit wants to go her own way um and so what do the rest of us do and and you know we had I don't know maybe 30 or 40 people in the room each broken up into groups of five it within those groups of five somebody was Italy somebody was France I mean the equivalent of these right um I can't remember what all the different countries were somebody was Germany but we were all also different members in the band and so your your role in the band was kind of making a play off of what your country's role was like in EU politics. So again, it was a very silly way to demonstrate this. In terms of learning objectives, um, it would be relatively thin what students could take away from that. Um, if they knew more about the European context, they could have fun with it. Certainly the predominantly European group of people that we were playing with, like they got the joke and were having fun with the joke. A group of American students might not might take a little longer to realize that this is about the EU and Brexit and what do we do now and um, but uh, but it was it was very clever. One of the features of it that I think is worth calling out that that was a feature in a number of LARPs that I played is that the GM actually either well so this one both of these things happened either the GM plays a character in the game so you're not actually outside of the game you're in the game. And in this case, our GM was like the manager of the manager. band. Yeah. Um, and then also there were pre-recorded messages so that throughout the game, as there were interventions from the GM, they weren't necessarily coming from that person. They, In this case, there were pre-recorded videos of uh, some, some other manager who was trying to get us all hyped up to go on tour again. Um, and so they were, you know, like you as the instructor, if you were doing something like that, if you had the pre-recorded stuff, right, you could actually be even less obtrusive than we are as GMs when we run reacting games. I think there's some pluses and minuses to doing it that way, but I saw that feature of recorded interventions um, happen frequently. Nick, I don't know if you want to talk about that game or the other game that we played together that was an edgy lab. Yeah, the, 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 I'll talk about the other one, which was about sustainability and the the scenario there. It's it w was set in 2050, and everybody was an ambassador from a different nation, and we were we were all uh, sort of at this conference to decide what what different of 10 different policy options, what were the ones that we thought we wanted to put most resources behind? So in this, in an interesting way, before the game started, this was very, very Nordic LARPy, is we paired off and in pairs initially talked to, to our counterpart and developed a shared memory about a positive thing that had happened to us 20 years ago. And then we got in a different pair and we talked about a negative memory that connected us 10 years ago. And then we got in a third pair and set another memory with somebody else. I don't remember what that one was. 
But that's a big part of Nordic LARP. What really drives a lot of Nordic LARP games are the personal relationships between the roles. So that was in there to sort of make these personal relationships. It didn't really come out in the rest of the game, though. So so for whatever reason, it, it didn't really, it wasn't enough to, to get your teeth into. Um, but then you sort of went around. Yeah, Mich Michelle posted the URL for the, the Polish um, NGO that put this together. And they do a bunch of other LARPs about sustainability, too. Um, and, uh, and then you go through some rounds and you make some decisions and there's some politicking and, uh, and things get really much, much worse. Uh, I think pretty much regardless of what you do, uh, which I, I think is like one of the, one of the meta takeaways where you're sort of like, dang it, if people in 2022 had done a bit more, things would not, you know, be, and be in such a bad shape. Um, and it was okay, but but like the game that Michelle described, uh, the learning objectives were pretty thin, and um, and it was really designed where the whole thing could be run in one session from from uh, setup. Um, you probably could have had a longer debriefing, but I don't know that you could have because there there wasn't a, a whole lot there. The 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 games that go deeper, the Nordic LARPs that go deeper into historical content is a, a whole genre of Nordic LARPing, which is historical LARPs. But from those, it, it seems like the historical setting, it a lot of it is really like, that's a cool setting. And, and if it's like, and it's in a castle, that's like double cool. Um, or, or, or it's at a, it's, in, it's at an old fishing village that we have rented or something like that. But the thing that I, I, other than a kind of a general impression about, wow, things in the past were really rough and you had to do a hell of a lot of laundry and cooking, um, it didn't really seem like people came away from those with a lot of historical knowledge. They came away with some sort of historical feeling, but one of the things that wasn't clear is how much of it was just them imagining the feeling of being a medieval peasant, uh, where where, and that maybe most of that is just based upon whatever their contemporary stereotypes are of medieval peasants, um, because like I I went to one workshop that was about historical LARPs. And um, one of the things that we did is we sort of broke into tables to design, to sort of scratch together what a LARP would look like. And the scenario that we chose was um, 50s housewives. And it was really clear, and we talked about as a table, like when we were conceiving of that LARP, what people were referencing were late 1950s, early 1960s sitcoms. And like that is where the information about like what that experience would be like. Um, so in that conversation, I was like, okay, this is a problem <laughs> you know, that we're just going to design this with stereotypes and people are then just going to play it with stereotypes. You know, so if we really like golden age of American sitcoms, maybe this could be cool. But if we want to actually find out about history, this is not good. So we made the decision they to set it. They wanted to, oh, also some of them wanted to do it during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they would be like, okay, that's cool, you know. And um, so what we decided was, is it would be set during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it would be about Cuban 1950, 1960s housewives. Um, something about which nobody at the table had any idea what that would be like. So we were like, okay, that would be cool because we would have to like figure out more about the historical reality of that situation. And everybody was like, right on. But then like 20 minutes into the conversation, you could tell that their, that their TV stereotypes were seeping back into it because it was like, oh, and then one of the roles will be a gossip. 
uh, you know, and that will be awesome for all these reasons. And one of the, you know, and, and so it really just became this kind of cavalcade of, of stereotyping, which I'm sure it isn't in every case. Um, but I, I think that by design and because people can bring a lot to their roles if they're bringing it from stuff they already know, which is pop culture, that makes it easy to slide right into a role. And, and I think that Nordic LARP doesn't resist that in the way that reacting does. That yeah, was a I long think, answer. I'm sorry I talked for so long. I think just in general, right, there, there's a lot of focus on genres, genres of fiction or film that people will be already really familiar with. And a lot of what I got the sense that people were doing with recreational LARP was just having the chance to fully immerse themselves in a fictional world that they enjoyed. Yeah. Um, and then to turn that into how do we learn about history um that that generally was a harder sell and uh you know we mentioned this last week but I'll, it's worth saying again um the game designers complained frequently that people who signed up to play their games and paid to play their games and were making costumes to play their games for months ahead of time um did not read their role sheets in advance and their role sheets would be one to two pages long Okay, so then when you have a historic LARP where the designer has actually produced a source book in advance of all sorts of information about, you know, that they've historically researched about how people lived and behaved in that time period um, that could help guide you in playing your character in a more historically accurate way, um, th of course, they weren't going to read that either. Um, so there seemed to be a real tension and and also, yeah, it did not sound familiar at all, Maddie, as you said. Um, but you know, but it was scary to me that these are people who are saying they want to do this recreationally, paying to have the experience, and still not willing to geek out when they have the materials months in advance. Um, and 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 a lot of the times, I mean, one of the other things that game masters would complain about was the degree to which their players would steer their characters so that they could take the stories in the directions that they wanted to take the stories. Um, and if the re if you're playing for fun, I uh, you know that that's it, it's hard as the GM unless it's going to break the game. Uh, somehow to to really push back against that. So, and in terms of that, you know, maybe I've ended up here in the in the Cuban apartment building, um, you know, but I really want to play this certain role in a certain way. I'm just going to do it, um, and that whatever I'm bringing in from outside the game is, is going to inform it maybe more than, than what I'm supposed to be doing inside the game. But Nordic LARP basically is like, okay, fine. We're not going to tell you a bunch of stuff that you're supposed to do. If you want to have a big knife fight, talk to the person before the game starts about the big knife fight you want to have, why you want to have the knife fight, who's going to win, and make sure that it's in a part of the game where you're going to get a lot of attention. But if somebody's going to die in this night fight or be severely injured, you need to talk to the game organizers to make sure that that's not going to mess something up. But if you just want to like yell at each other and have a knife fight and attract a lot of attention and you both walk away injured, but not seriously, like awesome, do that. Um, and wh whereas like in a reacting class, if that happened, it would be like, but the constitution, <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute. Uh, but for a Nordic LARP, it's, uh, that's good play. So like with the educational LARP, would it be more that maybe the game would set up the coming unit? Like it'd be a... Mm -hmm a way to garner information, get ideas peaked, but then here's where we're heading. What, might that be a use for it or it, it's just thin? 
I, I think like the games that we played, like the Europe game and the, the climate crisis in 2050 game, I think you could either use them as a way, like a quick one day game that doesn't require any preparation in advance as a way to introduce a set of themes that you're going to go into more deeply. Or you could do it as a sort of fun capstone exercise after you've studied something more in depth. Now let's apply this with a fun game. But I think in both cases, there's still the question pedagogically, like what's the point of like, why have the game? Why not just not have the game, right? Um, and and so in that sense, I think that that they're, the, the edulars that we were seeing on that model weren't really helpful. There were, I, I do want to say, there were other kinds of edulars. So um, Katrin uh, Genois, the, the German woman that Nick mentioned earlier, she was having her students do elaborate escape room type puzzles where they were role playing light in that they had these tablet devices that had pre-recorded prompts on them where I can't remember, it was like an alien invasion or something and they had to go around and solve puzzles um, in groups in order to save the planet, um, something like that. Um, yeah, like you could, you know, you, you know that, that oh, form, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Nick. I, I was just gonna say, and the puzzles were were multidisciplinary. So like some of the puzzles were math and some of the puzzles were about interactions and some of the puzzles were about art and that sort of thing. So I kind of got the sense that it was a thing you would do towards the end of a unit and it mm -hmm. would be the way of tying all these strands together and then doing it in a fun and interactive way rather than setting up a new thing. Right. Um, there also was this whole experiment that happened at a university somewhere in Scandinavia where there was like a psychology professor who managed to get some ridiculously large grant that she then used on developing an elaborate set um, to basically do a psychological experiment on players in a role-playing setting. Nick, I don't know if you remember that one. Um, uh, and, you know, and so that's very different. I mean, you know, the whole, the ethics of experimenting on your own students, I don't know about, um, but, uh, you know, she was paying for like all these research assistants to make observations of what was happening in the game. And I saw her present about this. And then later on, I talked to somebody who had been one of the research assistants who basically said like they had this huge grant from the EU and developed this elaborate scenario and they basically have no usable data like it just didn't produce anything um so you know, um but that you know like they were doing the elaborate set design and immersion into an experience with their students as part of you know part of that research right um yeah so there were there were very different models and then of course we we met up with some of these faculty who teach at this uh, Danish boarding school, which would basically be like a middle high school um, age range, where they the faculty work in two teams. Every week, one team is running a LARP all week long, teaching a unit of material on some subject or subjects. And the other faculty team is developing the LARP that the students will play the following week. And so then they just trade off positions. So you're always either developing the next LARP or playing one. Um, and yeah, so Nick just put in the chat the link to um, the wiki entry about the school. Um, and <clears throat> there's also a pretty good article. I, I'll put up the URL from Vice um, where the, where they investigated the the place. I'll put the URL up too. Yeah, and so that's just basically using role playing as a way to engage students' creativity as a permanent pedagogy, right? Not as just a piece of a class, but as the whole way that these students are going to learn. Um, so, you know, so we really did see a wide array of these models. Yeah, and, and, and I think, I mean, it goes back to a thing that we mentioned earlier, the, the people that are developing these different models, they, it's pretty clear that there's like one or two or other than this boarding school, there's one or two or maybe three people at an institution working on this. They don't really have any connections with anybody else other than talking to them at Cook Punk 
uh, or by sort of sharing articles that they've written about their different projects. There's not there's not a, a movement uh, or or anything like that. It's the good part of that is 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 it's really creative because all these people are coming up with different solutions. Um, thing as a reacting person that's a little frustrating is. A lot of the solutions that they've came up with come up with maybe only work at their school or in their country um, or in their particular education system because they've really sort of been designed to fit particular curricular demands ra rather than being um, you know more more flexible. Yeah, there was a whole group that was working specifically with. Uh, I think like advanced elementary students on the autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. And so we we're working specifically with special needs students on getting them to develop their own uh, LARPing scenarios and worlds and the backstory and what the sets would be like and what would happen in these worlds. Um, and that was, I mean, it sounded amazing, right? But then it also was harder to see, like, how do you package that and sell that to somebody who's not working with students in that specific type of population with those needs yeah. where you've got maybe more of a set curriculum that you need to work through? And um, yeah, and, <clears throat> and those same people, I, I talked to them one time, they have kind of like a road show where they do some LARPs for a variety of different kinds of students. But the way that it's set up is basically they don't, they don't have a home school. They just have a school invite them to come do a thing for the day. And then they like get in their van and they put in their costumes and their gear and they go out there and they do it. Um, but it's very much a, I've got a friend who teaches at this school and can get us on the schedule kind of a thing rather than it being more institutionalized. Mm -hmm. But I think that some of them like it that way. They like the kind of, you know, the 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 um, the freedom that that brings, and the and the ability to to it, it's it. But it's clearly like a side gig, um, and and they're doing other stuff besides. And this is just a fun part of their work that they get to do occasionally. They're always really happy when they get to do it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the big story that I got from all of this is that, you know, it was kind of like, sorry, my cats are fighting off screen. Um, it was like holding a mirror up to the reacting consortium and showing us what we're actually doing, because mm. we saw so many examples of things that we're not doing. And that made, I think, Nick and I much more aware that, I mean, you know, I think we went in there originally giving the presentation thinking that they'd be like, oh, you're only in like 500 schools, like big deal. <laughs> 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 and they were just like, they said, how many? Like, that was what was happening in the Q&A. They were like, how many places are using your games? Like they were just stunned. How many games do you have? And, and I thought they were basically like showing us that we didn't have anything. And it was the exact opposite that they were responding to. And, you know, so being more like self-aware that what we're doing is we're trying to write games to be used by a single instructor who's never played a game, let alone run a game. Um, uh, and that that's a different problem set to work with than trying to create a fully immersive experience that's fully and intensely emotional where people get to write their own storylines. I, I think it just is useful to be aware of what we are and what we're not. And I, I think for me as a game author and a person who often talks to game authors, it's it's really further strengthened um, my desire in those conversations to be like, you, your instructor's manual needs to hold their hand and you need to not give them so much to do. And it, it needs to be more accessible um, you, because I think one of the hardest humps of, of a game is getting, getting it out of your head and onto paper. Um, but I think one of the things that I took away from it was it would kind of be better when it comes out of your head and goes onto paper, if it doesn't take quite as much paper to explain it. Um, because even if you sort of write down 
oh, but I've carefully recorded special rule 64 that operates if the National Assembly does this, like nobody other than you is going to remember that. Um, so, so having a much simpler user's manual that is fairly bell and whistle free uh, is, is what I'm really striving for now, nowadays. Should we have Tony and Cindy introduce themselves since we sort of did the introductions earlier? Yes, let's do that. Okay, Tony, your mic's off, so why don't you go first? Oh, hey, what did I put it back yet? Hey, I'm Tony. Hi. Uh, I teach at Elon, astrophysics, uh, running, I'm running Rage right now. Uh, I'm going to run Galileo at the second half of the semester. Uh, and the last time you guys were all talking about LARPs, it really kind of blew my brain up a little bit. That, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Which I, I didn't want to, at some point I, I need to have a separate conversation about it because it, it sort of pieced together on the spectrum of reacting stuff that I do, but I run these epic finales at the end. And the epic finales are somewhere in the space between the Nordic LARPs and the rituals that you were describing last time, because you don't have a role, but there's a thing that you show up for, but it's meant to be educational, but for assessment, not for teaching. Uh, uh, but I also, when you're describing this as art, like that's how I think of the epic finales. Like I, there's no, there's no thing I can give to instructors to say, hey, just run this. Like I've got the artwork, the materials and all that sort of thing. And each one's different. Each year's different. That uh, for the it, for the aliens class, I felt like it was, it, and I ran three different, completely different uh, Nordic LARPish epic finales for the aliens class. But the but I decided I needed to do the same thing for a, a reacting class, and so I did it. I'm doing them for the Industrial Revolution Rage game and Galileo. But then the assessment are completely different assessments. You know, each testing a different aspect of, did you learn science or the notion or things that should have been taught in Galileo? And did you learn things that uh, should have been learned in the Industrial Revolution game? And can you apply those to a completely new scenario? Uh, but I'm kind of curious like about like how the materials, you sort of mentioned the role sheets and like they're a page or two. And I went digging to try and find like, if I was gonna run a Nordic LARP just with my friends around the house to get a sense of it. Like what's, where's a good place to start with that? Because I, I didn't, I found several websites, but I, it wasn't easy for me to figure out like, hey, here's a good place to try a couple of them. I've had exactly that problem. I, I found, and, they, and this was commented on at KP is there is no good clearinghouse and there is no good way to know if the LARP script you've got is good or not, other than word of mouth. And if you're not plugged into the community, you, you've got no word of mouth. So like just last week, I downloaded one from some site. I don't remember what it was. Um, picked one out of a list of 50, kind of randomly, because I was like, oh, sci-fi political that sounds cool um and i got it and i read through it and i was like well this could be fun but i don't know um and it's really that the instructions are also really sketchy where it's like okay you've got five computer workstations have these instructions and readouts next to the station but sort of like what the best way is to fabricate those do you actually are do you need screens? Do you need keyboards? You know, it, it was it was super vague. Undoubtedly, if I'd played it, I'd be like, "Oh, well, now I know how to do all this stuff." But uh, but but it required a lot of invention. But I think most Nordic LARPers would be like, "Yeah, good. You need to be totally inside the game and make it your game before you try to run it." So there was a Nordic LARP talk. Okay, so this was the night before Knut Punkt start started. Um, so after the Edu LARP conference, um, they had a series of these talks that are short, like five, 10 minute talks. They're recorded, they're on YouTube. I was just trying to find it, um, but didn't find it in time. Um, but one of the speakers this year was talking about trying to collect scripts and she is engaged in a project 
of trying to catalog all the scripts that exist right now. And there's one particular library, I think in Denmark or Sweden, that has already started in on doing this more locally, um, that has the vast majority of the scripts that she came across. Um, but she's also trying to collect them from elsewhere in part to solve this problem. Um, that said, the, the website that hosts the wiki that, that I linked to before, the nordiclarp.org site, is a good site to go to for, you know, as a clearinghouse on conversations that are happening in the Nordic LARP world, some theory, uh, the wiki, which is helping to define some classic, some now classic terms like bleed or alibi um, in the community, and just generally as a resource. It's not the same thing as a place to find scripts. Um, so should we move on to Cindy now? Yeah, Cindy? Hi, I'm Cindy um, in North Dakota. Uh, I'm pl pl playing, my students are playing um, Frederick Douglass right now and will be playing Greenwich Village later this semester. And I'm working on a game on reinterpreting controversial mon public monuments. And is there anything that you have on your mind right now or should we move on to Trey? All right, Trey, so. We're one hour in and we're still doing introductions. Well, because you just popped in. We're being polite. We're being polite. If you were here on time, we wouldn't have to do introductions an hour in. Wait, wait, we wait, did wait. not draw attention to your tardiness. Let, Trey, you speak about your introduction. I want to hear what Cindy's controversial monuments are. I played that game. Back in <laughs> It's dangerous to get me starting talking about my game. I don't want to hijack. I mean, just, just send me a link. Nick just and me a Michelle have spent far too much time discussing my game. Okay, at this never point. mind. I'll bring this one up in the chat. There we go. I, if, I don't want to hijack. I'm happy to talk about it if 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 everybody's interested, but but um, I don't want to hijack the Nordic LARP discussion. So I'll just that'll be a backup plan if there's time. So uh, earlier in the chat, uh, someone was asking, and sorry, I forget who it was, um, what were some of the topics that came up last week that we haven't talked about? Um, so the, the, the big topic that we haven't talked about yet today is workshopping. Um, so one of the things that uh, Nordic LARP tends to do is workshopping before you start playing the game. So it's not just prepping in the sense of, here's where the bathrooms are and here's your role sheet and this is the scenario we're playing or even these are the safety mechanics that we're going to be using in the game. Um, uh, but workshopping is actually working in uh, small groups. So in my experience, it was either one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one, um, to develop your character and maybe even work through part of your story or what you wanted to play out in the game before the game began. Um, Nick, do you want to say more about workshopping? Yeah, pro probably the best workshopping experience that I had was in a historical LARP that was set in the city of Fiume, which is now the city of Rijeka, which is on the coast of the Adriatic, um, right after World War One. So it, it it's a, was a game with eight players, and we were in two families of four. So as part of the workshopping, we sat together as the four members of the family and then listening to prompts from the game master, <clears throat> two of us would form a relationship, uh, a shared memory, something about a tension between us, something about why we loved each other. Um, the other two people would mainly listen. Um, but as it went on and, and everybody was building a relationship with everybody else, that it sort of started to crystallize. So the the later relationships that we were talking about what made more sense because they connected to the relationships that we'd already formed. So this was really cool and easy and and was uh, allowed all of us to slide into our roles and gave us a sense about how we would relate to each other as the game went on. Um, Two things about it 
<clears throat> that sort of fit things that that we were talking about earlier in the hour. Um, one was as we formed these relationships, almost every and I talked to people about this in the debriefing afterwards to make sure that I wasn't making things up. Lots of people were drawing upon once they sort of had a sense of their role is the relationships that they formed were because of a figure from pop culture or literature or film that was a lot like their role. So I was a sort of a paterfamilias. So, you know, I, I was sort of pulling in from, from other, from other stories um, and thinking about how that role would work. But because we had a real similar cultural background, all of these meshed really easily with each other. Um, so this made it easy, but one of the things as an educator that made me doubtful about the usefulness of the game as an educational experience is when we did the debrief, all anybody talked about was their personal experience in terms of how they had related to other family members. Um, so like the history of the situation was totally set dressing and it was just sort of like, okay, when exterior threat X, which could have been anything raised the stakes, I really loved it when we had that interaction about such and such. Um, but it was the interaction that was the thing that really myself included, you know, where, where I was like, that was really cool. That was really engaging. But the fact that it all took place in this like totally freaky, cool, historical situation that's fascinating for all kinds of things, none of that was mentioned, like was even mentioned in the debriefing. Um, so that sort of showed me the power and ease of that kind of character building, uh, which, which I really liked. In terms of how useful it is as an educator, it, it also gave me some caution. So I, I'll explain workshopping in a different LARP that I played that was based in more of a sci-fi kind of a scenario where the idea is that exactly at the midpoint of your natural life, uh, you suddenly develop a symbiotic creature that lives outside of you. And I'm all about show and tell today. So uh, this is Jedediah, uh, my symbiotic creature um, from that game. So he was sort of a stuffed uh, blob with a bunch of buttons and then little bits and pieces of fabric attached to him. Um, okay, so that's my show and tell from that game. Um, so we basically, like the scenario was that when you reach the midpoint, this thing suddenly appears in your life and it's going to follow you around for the rest of your life. And it is an externalization of your emotions. Um, and so to help you adapt to your new reality that this thing that externalizes your emotions is gonna follow you around, you are sent to a two week retreat. And so the game was a group of people at midlife gathering in group therapy sessions um, at some retreat place that we decided was a really fancy place with really good food. Um, uh, having, you know, talking about what it's like to have this creature or um, what it's like to be at midlife, to know that this is really the midpoint of your life or whatever questions came up to us. But in order to do this, we had to develop some characters beforehand because um, this is a, that's a pretty abstract scenario, right? And so we were given a worksheet. We were told to pick a name from a set of slips with names on them, pick a set of gender pronouns from slips that have different different gender pronouns on them and pick an age because what would be the natural midpoint of our lives could vary a little bit depending upon who we were. Um, and so that sort of formed the basics. Then we were supposed to give our, our characters like three adjectives about their personality. And then we started workshopping with other people. So the first thing we did was an exercise that the GM called the hot seat where we broke into groups of three and in groups of three, we each took turns where one of us would be in the hot seat and the other two would be asking questions. And so for five minutes, the other two people would just ask you rapid fire questions. Um, uh, where did you grow up? What's your biggest fear? Um, what's your favorite vacation you've been on? 
what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Like whatever it was that was coming to us. And you just had to answer with the first thing that came to your mind in that rapid fire scenario, right? What's your favorite color? Whatever it was. Um, and then when the five minutes were over, you were given a break to sort of write down like what you had learned about who you are based on what you had said in that rapid fire scenario. Um, so that helped very quickly to get some more meat on the bones of the character. And then after that, we started workshopping in dyads. So we were broken into groups of two. We had two people who were gonna be at the therapy session who we had, we'd known from our previous lives. And so we had to figure out how do we know each other? Are we related? Are we good friends? Do we hate each other? Um, are you somebody I always see at the bus stop, but I never talk to? Uh, like, what, what exactly is our connection? What's our backstory? Um, and so then we started playing the therapy, the first therapy session with all of that material. So it was very quick um, and it helped it to be more immersive in that there were people, once we started playing, who I already had a relationship with. It might be superficial, it might be deeper, but we were already, we we had something to start with instead of starting from scratch and Gesundheit. Um, all right. So those are different examples of what workshopping can be um, and different kinds of games where workshopping might be appropriate. Nick? So, so I think in this, because I, I probably sound a little bit down on this kind of workshopping and, and is one of the things that Michelle and I started talking about, like after the conference was, well, how would we do workshopping for, for Greenwich Village? You know, so so it's one of these things where I think that, that I'm, I, I think Michelle and I are on the same page where we're like, partly because we experienced it firsthand, where we're like, that was super powerful. And that was, and, and it was fun and it was pretty easy to do. Um, and now we're like, how can we use that for educational purposes? All right, Trey. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, kind of maybe even just engage on what uh, Nick was saying, because you kind of, you raised this last week and um, I think like this would be a good topic for another uh, Friday session, but even like a an idea of how to engage with this very community that you've just connected with of the, of the LARPing world in that like workshopping is obviously a really powerful tool, but the objectives in the LARPs you experienced or in a lot of LARPs right now are just different than what reacting wants to do. And that might be a really interesting thing to explore if, you know, to workshop for ideas or to workshop for history, as opposed to workshopping for emotion or workshopping in order to do collective world building. Um, you know, LARP, I mean, it's a, even a movement within LARP and educational LARP too, where, where they, they talk about like LARPing for transformation. And like, that's not exactly what reacting doing and that's okay but like that might be an interesting thing to explore uh because like we are trying to center texts and ideas at the center of the experience and so if you're going to workshop like this is a great place to bring these things out and like get everybody on the same page of you know what's the playing space in the field of ideas that we're engaging in and um and also just kind of like a healthy recognition that some of the stuff that's going to work in LARP, where again, um, like LARP as part of like the role-playing game world, and there's a tradition of like generating your own characters or, it, or you know, a lot of these games, like it's just efficient design to let the players do collective world building. But again, that's going to be like cross purposes for reacting. You know, like we we actually need to communicate um, some actual facts and actual realities um, that people should engage with the history on some on terms that we can agree about. Even. Um, and so that might be an interesting thing to explore, to workshop for ideas or to workshop for history, um, especially because 
I think as somebody who's kind of come in and observed reacting from the outside, like things that sometimes drive me crazy are, you know, here's a hundred pages of primary source material that you should engage with before you've played one minute of the game. And we see how students bounce off of that all the time. Whereas workshopping would be a way to kind of bring everybody to like the minimum knowledge level for engagement on the ideas that should be at the core of an experience. So just kind of, I'm just spitballing some ideas here, but also saying like, I think this is a really interesting idea that we should explore. As so, so I've been saying in the chat a couple times today that I think Mary Jane Tracy does the LARPiest reacting game design. And, and that was partly why Nick and I went to thinking about how to do this in Greenwich Village, because a lot of the characters are supposed to have more, you know, in some cases very intimate, but closer relationships to one another than often is the case in a reacting game. And I think the same thing can be said about her Argentina game, right, where it's a bunch of kids in a high school. And when when I've run it in my classes, right, my students act as if they don't know much about who they are, in part because they don't know much about who they are. The role sheets are thin and they're not based on real historical characters and they can't go out and find out more information. But they're also supposed to be acting like they're kids in high school who have been in school together for years. And so in that kind of a game, I actually think workshopping could accelerate the gameplay. Um, you know, so I could imagine breaking them up into to groups. So this is a little bit more like a different LARP that I played at, at Knutpunkt, where you take like three boys who really love football, because that's one of the things that, that is in the game, right? They're following the Argentinian football team. Um, that's soccer for you Americans. Um, and, you know, and so they're having like their memory of like kicking the ball around in their neighborhood or what happened when, you know, the day that Argentina won, won the World Cup last um, and what their memories are of that as a way to like give those the people who are playing those three boys, right, some sense of bonding so that then once the game, the game starts, they're already a little, you know, like they've got their in jokes, they've got a way of relating to one another that is appropriate to being a group of teenagers in a high school. Michelle, just before we go to Tony, can you talk about, we all know what lipstick means? Oh, we all know what lipstick means, yeah. Okay, so this is um, the workshopping, Nick knows what lipstick means. Um, we, we uh, this was workshopping I did in a different game that Nick and I are hoping we might be able to play with some folks from the reactive community. We're still trying to work this out, don't, no promises. Um, but this is a game by a Mexican American designer who lives in New York. Um, and, uh, and it's set with a group of nine high school students at a party uh, in a Mexican town on the border with the US in the late 2000s. And so to set this up and to like help us to play really quickly, they broke us up into three groups of three. So I was in a group with two other girls from the high school who um, all watched the same telenovela. And what we were told to workshop was what's the name of the telenovela and what's a catchphrase from the telenovela that the three of you all know and you repeat, like that's your sort of in-joke catchphrase. And I can't remember what we called the, the telenovela, but the catchphrase was, everyone knows what lipstick means. And so at any point in the game, when we wanted to like exclude people or bond with each other, or, like signal our connection to one another, all you needed to do was say, everybody knows what lipstick means. And it doesn't matter that none of us actually knew what that phrase meant, right? <laughs> the irony of that phrase, um, like we had no idea what the lipstick meant, um, but it created this sense in the gameplay that we were connected and that the other six students didn't know what we were talking about. And so they would feel excluded in that moment or like, what are these silly girls talking about? And we would feel part of a, a group um, very, very quickly. And again, the other three groups were having their own moments of coming up with their bond, their bonds together that, again, would help me to realize I have no idea how they know each other, but they clearly know each other. Um, and so we could just instantly get into the immersion in the gameplay. Uh, Tony? 
yeah, I was just going to say in terms of the, that was the other thing that you said last time that really stuck in my head about the, the workshopping. But I, I think I disagree about which kind of games would be most appropriate for because, you know, I've run Greenwich Village a lot and it already has, like, it. you're right, it is the most uh, LARPiest or is LARPy. And I would probably say Rage is pretty LARPy. Lar Rage is a, Nord or is a Regency LARP. <laughs> I did not realize that until you said that before. Rage is a Regency LARP to some extent, but those already have relationships that the students understand because there's wives and husbands and and those kinds of relationships. Uh, but games like Galileo, as originally written, was just completely sterile where they were just like, I'm conservative Cardinal 1, conservative Cardinal 2, conservative Cardinal 3, right? Moderate Cardinal 1, moderate Cardinal 2, moderate Cardinal 3. Oh, I'm a moderate professor. But I'm a moderate professor too, all right? And so so adding in the real characters helped that to some extent. But even then, they're all playing uh, Italian Catholics, you know, or Italian Catholic men uh, that are the professors. Or the, and like it doesn't, it's still, they, although those characters actually had relationships because they were professors or students of those professors or students of those professors or in this very cultish uh, Lynchian Academy, that they just don't dive into that. They focus on they actually focus on the stuff that's relevant to the game, but then it just it takes a while for it to gain the same sort of emotional investment that you get in Rage and that you get in Greenwich Village. I mean, people love Greenwich Village. That's why I played it. People love the 68 game. I didn't, I had no reason to play those games other than I heard people liked them. And Galileo's lack that. But I think this would do that to sit them down and say, all right. Here's the relationships that you need to have that that lipstick thing that Michelle was talking about between those characters. Like, what's the worst exam that you had with this uh, with this professor? Or, you know, what's the most annoying thing that this cardinal does? You know, at the at the meetings of the Dominicans. Just so because that those those sterile games, I think, need it more than the games that already have some of it. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, and, and I think that the way potentially to design those is you make it so that they're building a shared memory uh, or or something on a sort of an ephemeral thing where we don't have a historical record of it. And that's because it's actually not all that important, but it gives this human dimension to their characters and to their relationship with one another um which, which i think can be really handy for games like that i i think they just have to be carefully crafted because something like an inside joke can just like end up taking over a lot of the discourse and uh in a way that doesn't inform anything but it's hilarious when you're part of the inside joke um so i think yeah figuring out how to design those so that they link people into the game without them becoming the game is 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 a, a serious trick to pull, try to pull off. And, and I just want to say that like the 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 reason why I think Nick and I first started brainstorming like what do we do to Greenwich Village is that it seemed easier to imagine what the workshopping is that that you might do for characters in that game and a little harder to imagine it for other games. And I just wanna say like, if we actually did start building this into game design, there are some major logistical, logistical issues for implementing this in a real classroom, okay? If you've got a, a set of characters who are supposed to be spending the workshop time figuring out their backstory, and only one of those students is in the game, where the workshop is designed around having all 25 characters cast, but you've got a class of 15, right? We need to figure out like, how do you scale that up and down with the different characters that would be cast and the different combinations of people who might actually show up so that we're not giving a blueprint to instructors who've never done this before. Again, back to that point about reacting and it's actually not usable for them. It makes the whole thing more confusing. They don't see the learning objective in it at all. And what we've done is actually made reacting games harder for new people to implement rather than better, right? And I mean, so, so we're just, we just wanna be experimenting with this right now and figuring out how to do this well and how not to do it well or how to do it badly so that we don't do it badly and we can design it 
better for all games? Because I agree, Tony, that lots of games could use this. Tony, go for it. Oh my God. It, Zoom now recognizes when I have my hand up and it puts the hand icon up. I hadn't seen that one yet. Is that what happened? I, you didn't do anything? Yeah, I didn't touch a button. I put my hand up. I think you have you have a specific feature turned on that I saw and, this morning for the first time. And it just started a little timer and it put the hand up. All right. If you go to reactions and click on the little up arrow, it says now recognize hand gestures. And yep. now we'll see that I've got my hand up. Wow. That's the way we're living in. All right. So we have this for posterity. You 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 your question gave me the answer that I was looking for, Michelle, because the, the easiest place to put this in is in the faction quiz. That that we already designate a time for faction quizzes. Uh, for most games. And so you don't actually do the pairing of things. You end up going through and saying, put it like in the faction, you know, uh, what, you know, and then kind of have them come up with something within the faction. That doesn't solve the problem of having them come up with information about other factions. But if you're talking about ease of implementation, the faction quiz is the easiest place to put that one so that each of those factions have their own in jokes. And you just put that as a one or two questions or maybe three questions at the end uh, that they try to figure out uh, after they've done the, the content ones. Did Tony say anything over the last 60 seconds? I really no. don't. It's recorded, just watch the recording. I was um, just kind of riffing on our, our discussion of uh, like what might be interesting uh, workshopping thing is like one thing I'm like I really try to rule out in my games and and this is kind of a difficult concept that I'm not sure I'm 100% right about it but in some ways like when you put mechanisms in the game that are well defined that students can engage with you're also kind of elbowing out what I call make them ups you know, make them up just being like, hey, I'm a student, I'm going to come up with a creative idea, and I'm going to go run it past the instructor who's going to reward me for my creativity. Or even worse, I'm going to do make them ups with my students, and we don't know what's real anymore, um, kind of thing. And so like the danger of some of these um, workshopping that, that Nick and Michelle experienced in New Punks is that they are explicitly are make them ups like they're they're inviting people to kind of make them up and i pretty sure we don't want to do that like that's 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 like a path to a historical thinking and so you know uh i do think that maybe like ritual is a place where you ritual like broadly is a way to kind of do that time travel to character right and i'm thinking even of something a historical like if i'm doing a Game of Thrones LARP and we are all members of the Night's Watch. Like if you've watched Game of Thrones, you know, like they do that oath. They take the oath to become a member of the Night's Watch and then they say, you know, and now his watch is ended when someone has died in the Night's Watch. But this is something they can do as a group where they're not doing a make them up. They're being, they're performing a ritual or something that puts them in the proper mindset for the, you know, the historical space in which they're entering. And so I can think something like Galileo would have a lot of opportunity for that of of you know things things that you might do as a ritual or as a as a shared experience that will put you in the correct time space and and, and mindset just as, as something especially like and I think that would be easy for a new professor to do because like the difficult thing generically for reacting is the professor that has to be the all knowing you know, GM, game master who knows all things and is the ultimate arbiter of reality, as opposed to following instructions of this is what you do with your players now. And they go through this kind of really scaffolded experience that's going to put them, have them engage with the ideas we want them to engage with in this scenario. I feel like we already have ritual in the games like that. That is, we have the liminal moment that takes you into the game. And it's it's hard for me. Like I'm I'm not nixing this tray. I'm just saying. Like I want to actually think through a specific. Well, maybe give game. me some examples. Is this like the pig in Athens or something like that? Or right, yeah, or the armory show in Greenwich Village, or saying the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of Chicago, or yeah, um, right. and so those those might be rituals, but I don't think they're actually doing the things 
that workshopping was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is, we already have, we have something like that, that is not serving this particular purpose of helping the students understand their relationships with at least some of the players before the game starts. And that's really important. Okay, so, so one of the other things we were talking about last week, um, so I think this is especially for Cindy, is the concept of the status line. So my understanding of what this means um, from what I was able to glean is that you have everybody line up, trades explain this slightly differently, but you have everybody line up in order of their um, status in the game, right? And when you have a linear status order, this is maybe easier to do than when you've got some cross-cutting cleavages of class and gender and race and so on. Um, but then, then, like the presumption is everybody can see where they stand in the status line and they can see where the other players are. And so there's a certain kind of understanding about how you relate to the other people that you're playing with um, that's established in some kind of exercise like that before the game begins that could then help you to maybe more, more be more accurate historically in how you're relating to others. So the example I had in the back of my mind when I was hearing about this at Knut was uh, the, the Patriots and Loyalists game where my students are always really uncomfortable with insisting that they be called judge or mister um, or really uncomfortable with distinguishing between the status of, of someone who is an enslaved person in the game or a woman in the game and someone who is actually a propertied white man who has a voting position in the, the provincial Congress. Um, and so like, I'm also thinking about workshopping as helping our students to get into those sorts of play. Um, and again, like a single ritual to me is not quite the same it's, as being able to visually identify that this other person in my class who I think of as an equal to me in status because we're both college students, I now have to treat as my social inferior or my social superior all of a sudden, but only when I'm in gameplay. And I need to remember when I see them, that's what our relationship is. Um, and there's just something about the workshopping that helped to really quickly embed that in the way that I related to people who had been complete strangers to me, you know, half an hour before. And I knew to treat them differently because of what we had done. Tony? Yeah, that, I mean, that you're absolutely right that uh, when we do that in rage, actually, when we line them up, they figure that out real quick. And because uh, they have a literal number, the Colquitt order <laughs> uh, published. And, and so that, uh, you know, it's easy for them to line up like that. But uh, uh I think you're also right that uh, the thing that the ritual wouldn't do is, is it doesn't individualize the students enough. Like there's there's always more talkative students and less talkative students. And by having you know individual roles, that sort of helps nudge and students to call that are more talkative to call out the less talkative students for time to time because they have to because that's a distinct character that needs to that needs to talk. But having that be a little uh, some fun thing, uh, like the these these uh, workshopping things that you're talking about, I think is probably an easier way to slide those students into the game, or to because they're not speaking because they're worried they're going to say something wrong, and so just to give them a, a something to say, period, gets them comfortable talking in front of the others. Uh, and usually that happens over time. I mean, and I've tracked it, like, like I've gone through and measured how they progress through there. And so over time that happens, but to try and find a way to put, to spritz a little bit of gas on that fire. And I think this workshopping would do that particularly for, or, or particularly helping the students that speak the least. You're right that it's going to be, you know, might dilute a little bit of what the students that are speaking the most say. But I, I think that'd be a sacrifice I'd make if I if I've got the student that only speaks every other class to speak maybe twice per class. I'll test it out. I'll let you know if it works or not. <laughs> I, I know that 
I know that putting rage in front of Galileo though yeah. helped Galileo. Like just having the games in reverse order where rage doesn't have the or rage has the relationships. And so they always enjoy that versus Galileo. Even when I have the characters that should have relationships, they didn't. And so when I had them in chronological order, they'd get through Galileo and be like, yeah, okay, whatever, we're done. And now we get into rage and they enjoy. And one year I had to switch it just because the calendar. It wasn't like I had a brilliant idea. It's just like, well, the calendar means I can fit rage first. And all of a sudden, both games were better. The rage kept building and it was a, and they were happier with it from the start. But then Galileo kept building because the you know it got those students were comfortable, and so it's not like the material is that much more complex in either game, but it's just the way the relationships work that they understand weddings and children and death and the power structure of the earl, uh, and being a very top down thing you know, in the peasants versus it's more complex with Galileo, but they can get into it. They've been scaffolded up to it both intellectually but all, but more important i think uh i wouldn't say emotionally but comfort like just comfort and and speaking well in front of others so i can imagine there being ritual around like you know marking the liminal space that now we are about to do something very different from what we've been doing or now we're coming out of this space of hierarchy and going back to a more egalitarian 2022 classroom um, you know, to sort of restore that at the end of a class session or the end of the game. Um, but I think anything that can help the students to be more historically embedded, immersed, like however we want to describe that, um, I think is is good. And the question is, can we do it? I think we can also, you know, just to, like, play counter uh, the devil's advocate to my own position a few minutes ago. I think we can also develop workshopping exercises, but then say in the instructor's manual, especially for new instructors, feel free to skip this. Like this is not essential to playing the game. Um, and that's sort of like what Mary Jane does in her games already is she has like all these optional exercises, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, but we can, you know, so I think we can just make it optional so it's not an extra thing that has to be a barrier to adoption. But um, but I do think if what you're trying to do is to build relationships between just a few characters at a time, there is still this issue of casting and how many roles are in the game and how do you do that effectively when you can't guarantee that even all the students you've cast are going to be there in class on that particular day. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so um, so I, I really would love to play with this. I'm not teaching reacting at all this year. Um, and so I can't do this in my classroom, but Nick and I were, were thinking of trying to build out some sample workshopping for a game that then we would basically co-GM at the Institute yeah. um, to try to try it out. And I and I'm running Greenwich Village in the spring, so so there's the possibility I might try to do something. Yeah, you because know, I agree with Tony that the games that probably could benefit from this the most are the ones that have these dry relationships. But I think for Greenwich Village, it would be easy to build it. Like you, you know, but I I wouldn't have to think too hard. I I could sort of see what those conversations should be. Well, Michelle and I sketched right fifteen of them out. Uh, you know, uh, in kind of a back to the envelope very calculation. Yeah. A very productive coffee and cardamom bun breakfast. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> By the way, if you have not had Swedish cardamom buns, you have not lived, you must have these things. They are amazing.